All righty. Well, good evening, guys. My name is Joe Durant, and I'm going to be talking with you guys this evening about the Dolphin Neurostem. All right. You guys can hear me now? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay. All right. So let's get started here. Uh, all right, so back to the beginning. Good evening, my name is Joe Durant. Um, with a few technical difficulties here, I'm gonna be doing a tutorial for you guys tonight on the Dolphin Neurostem. So if you, everybody can grab your Dolphin Neurostem so you can have a look at it. And the first thing we're gonna do is go over the features and functions of this. So if everybody will look on the, the front side of this, you will see several things. You'll see a black button, you'll see a roller switch, and then you'll see another button right here. So if you turn the roller switch on, this is your on and off button and your intensity button. If you turn that on and roll it around, you'll see a light on the back that comes on. That light tells you that your power source is on and that you have a good battery. If you do not see that light, it indicates you have a bad battery. So I've got an example of that right here. Here's another Dolphin Neurostem that has a bad battery. So I'm gonna turn it on. And when I do, you can hear the tone, but you don't see a light on right here, okay? So that indicates that you need to change the battery. And we'll go over how to change the battery in just a little bit. But if you do see this, you need to go ahead and have a spare battery handy so you can change the battery. All right. So you have an on and off switch. And the more you roll this switch, the just the intensity of the, of the unit itself. And you have a button right here that when you push it, activates the device. As long as you're holding this button down, the device will be activated. But as soon as you let up on this button, the device stops, okay? So as long as you're holding that down, you can do a treatment. But once you release this, it's not doing anything. If you move farther down, you're gonna find another button right here. This button, if you push it, is a consistent, is a constant treat button. So once you push that, you'll notice that the light is going to beep, but it's not gonna make any noise. So this is a feature that we have so that you can use the device without continuing to put your finger on the button. So if you're going to be doing vagus nerve stimulation or scar release or something that requires a bit of time, then you can um, activate this feature. To end it, you simply either push that button again, and you'll notice the light stop beeping, stop flashing, or you can turn the device off. On the back side of the device, if you look, you're going to see two slider switches. One of the slider switches says polarity. And you'll notice that there's a negative symbol, a positive symbol, and then a positive and a negative symbol. So this is your negative polarity, your positive polarity, and your biphasic channel. Um, when you are looking at the, at the book that comes with a unit, and you're looking at protocols, there's either gonna be a plus or minus sign next to each of the um, acupuncture points that you need to locate. So there's a device, there's a, a book that comes with this called, this is Vagal Up. And if you look in here, here's an example right here you'll see that there is next to the letter CB17, there's a negative symbol. So that tells you that you're gonna put this device on the negative polarity right there, okay? So when you're treating the, the treatment points in your books, always check the polarity that's in the book um, and it's gonna give you basically give your directions. Um, below that is a little slider, slider switch that says um, dry, wet, and normal. So this has to do with the sensitivity of the ohmmeter on the device. If you're doing vagus nerve stimulation, 
Um, you're not going to be using this feature that much because you're not going to be finding acupuncture points. But this particular slider switch allows you to adjust the sensitivity of the tip of the unit uh, and your ability to find acupuncture points. So um, when you use this to find acupuncture points, you're going to be testing the electrical conductivity of your skin. Every acupuncture point is electrically more conductive than the surrounding tissue. Um, and if you, um, if you are on one of the points, you're gonna notice that two things happen. The pitch of the unit is going to go up and the, um, the light will actually go off most of the time that you're on the, on the tip. So um, in just a second here, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to show you how to turn on the unit and hold it and find an acupuncture point. So um, to hold these devices, you're going to put it in your hand like you're holding a pen, OK? And you see a lot of people doing different things to hold these devices. But when you hold this, you've got to have your thumb on this metal plate on the back, OK? You can't not touch that plate. It is extremely important. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to complete the electrical circuit, and you'll be doing basically active pressure. All right, so with your thumb on the metal plate, holding it cradling in your hand, if you turn the device on and put it on, and my skin is a little bit um, dry today, so I'm going to put it on the dry setting, and I'm going to pull this across my skin. Let me turn this so you can see it. And you'll notice that you can hear the pitch go up. And as the pitch goes up, you'll also see that the light goes off. And that indicates that I'm directly over an acupuncture point. Now, depending on how wet or dry your skin is, sometimes this light will not go off. So um, you, can do, you can adjust the sensitivity of it right here. But do keep in mind that some people uh, have very wet skin. Uh, but if you work with elderly patients, or if you live in a very dry environment, sometimes your skin will be so dry that you're gonna to need to, um, to kind of wipe it off with a, uh, a damp cloth and dry it to hydrate your skin enough to find the acupuncture points. Um, down here in the South, usually your skin's a little bit moister, but we've been using air conditioning today and everything's a little, a little bit drier. So this is how you find acupuncture points. The important thing about finding acupuncture points in this device is that you go slowly. So if you move really quickly with this, you're gonna skip right over the points. Um, I've been doing this about 20 years, and I can tell you that um, the faster you move, the harder it is to find points. But if you take your time and move slowly, you're gonna do okay with this. Um, the other thing you need to know about using the point finder on this device is that you can't push too hard. So there are a couple of reasons for that. One is you would be concerned with the integrity of your skin or your patient's skin. Um, this is spring loaded. So it really limits the chances that you're gonna hurt yourself or someone else, but it is still a sharp tip. So you need to be careful. Um, and if you, if you turn this device on and you push really, really hard anywhere, you'll notice that the light will go out and the pitch will go way up. So when you're doing that, basically what you're doing is you're compressing the skin so much that you're increasing the electrical conductivity. And so you're basically creating false acupuncture points. So when you do this, you wanna use slow and steady pressure as you pull this across the skin. And it's gonna be a little frustrating for the first probably 20 or 30 minutes you try this, and then you'll start to pick up on it. Um, my advice is before you try to do any treatments, um, look through the book and pick out a few of the points and um, just try to find them. Anything on your hand is going to be a wrist. It's going to be a little bit easier just because you can get to it. Um, and then once you kind of have that skill down, you can use it to start finding points. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples of some acupuncture points that you can practice finding. So if you look at your wrist, um, if you flex your wrist, if you flex your wrist forward, you'll notice there's several creases here on the on the um, at the bottom of your hand. But if you bring your wrist back, there's really only one crease, and it kind of follows the, the base of the palm of your hand. So if we look at that crease 
and then flex our wrist forward a little bit, there's another crease that's just below that, okay? So we're gonna call this, this very most distal crease, the one farthest away, our, um, our kind of our, our location crease, um, but our treatment crease is gonna be the crease just below this, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your hand and you're going to feel over by your thumb on this crease. So you're gonna find that second wrist crease and you're gonna take your finger and you're gonna feel. And if you move it around just a little bit, you're gonna locate the radial pulse. So the radial artery runs right by here. And this is where you would check your pulse. Um, so if you take the device and put it not on top of the pulse, but towards the center, just a little bit from there on that second crease, you'll notice that you can find acupuncture points. So there's, a, there's an acupuncture point right here on the lung meridian. Um, it's good for grief issues. It's a parasympathetic common point. You're going to see it pop up in some of the vagus nerve simulation protocols that you see. And if we go on that same crease across to about right here, so that if I were to take my hand and spread my hand out, spread my pinky finger out on a line straight down from here where it intersects that second crease is another acupuncture point on the heart meridian. So we've got one right here. So you'll notice as I pull this around, you can hear a high pitch. There's a high pitch squeal. Let's see if I can get the light to go off for you. And the light's going off. So there's one of your heart acupuncture points there. And the last one we're going to go over is um, pretty close to there, but it's, it's actually on the middle of your wrist. So from this, from this farthest out wrist, wrist crease, if you go one, two, three fingers, and then kind of feel between the tendons right here, there's an acupuncture point here called pericardium six, it's called P6. It's an influential acupuncture point for the chest. Um, it's used for things like um, asthma, breathing difficulties. Um, it's also used in COVID recovery. Um, and you'll also find it to be useful for broken heart syndromes because the pericardium influences the heart. So it's also an emotional point. So each of these points will target emotional issues as well as physical issues. So pericardium is your, um, is your broken heart point. So we're going to locate that point now. So I've got one, two, three fingers. And I'm going to feel between the tendons right here. And there's my point. You can double check yourself. If you push in between the tendons and flex your wrist forward, it's quite tender right there. If it's not tender, you probably don't have a point. So again, pericardium six, influential for the chest and broken heart issues um, and breathing and respiratory problems. You have. Um, you have your, um, oh, and this one is actually also good for morning sickness. So if you happen to be pregnant, it's a good morning sickness point. Um, over here on your, um, on your heart points. So heart points are good for anxiety type issues. The heart is considered to control the mind in acupuncture. So when your mind is working too much, you're gonna treat heart points. And with the lung, the lung is, and it's consistent with grieving. So if you're having um, issues with grieving from deaths in the family or relationships, it's a good acupuncture point. But these three acupuncture points together make up what we call the golden triangle in acupuncture. So a lot of times you will see um, in our literature um, to treat these three points before you do any of the other protocols. And this is always a good way to start treatment because it calms the nervous system down it starts to lower your cortisol levels and just kind of drop your overall level of arousal. Um, all right, so we're going to move along to our next step here. And uh, we're going to work on actually setting up the vagus nerve stimulator itself. So um, you should have gotten a box that looks like this. And inside the box, there is a book that says Vagal Up. Uh, there is a board that has a cup on one end of it and a male plug on the other end of it. So if you take this cup 
and actually look inside of it, you'll see a little piece of metal inside there. That piece of metal has to connect with the tip of this unit. So when you put this on, you can't just barely put it on. You have to push it on firmly. Don't force it, but put it on firmly so that the tip of that will come in contact with it. And the way you're gonna test it is this. You're gonna put your thumb on this plate. You're gonna turn the unit on or finger on there. And you'll notice that when I touch this plug, the tone goes up and the light goes off. So the electricity is going, is touching my finger, running up through my arm and going back into the unit right here through this finger. So I know that I've got a good connection there. So that connection is complete. I'm gonna turn the unit off. And there's also a, um, there's a bag in here that has a little dolphin nurse stem logo on it. And inside the bag, you're going to find another cord, it's white. And if you pull that out, there's a little plastic sleeve on that. Just set that aside. And depending on what version of you get, of this you get, some of the white cords will have two male ends of it. And some of them will, it'll look like a female end, but it's actually just a shroud over this metal piece. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, they're both exactly the same. They do the same thing. There are some small little oval shaped electrodes in a bag. So you're going to pull those out. You want to make sure that the metal face here is clean. So I usually use an alcohol wipe on here before I put anything on there. So especially if you do massage work or any kind of body work, you, if you have any lotion on your hands when you use this, you need to clean this off carefully. Um, and you're gonna take one of these oval pads, and you're gonna put it on the unit itself and stick it on like this. And you're gonna connect your white cable, which some people call the ground cable. It's really an, an anode cable. So we've got this connected. And um, you are going to then connect that up with one of these rectangular pads. So when you connect this pad up, before you put this pad on your skin. Um, if you clean your skin really well, like use an alcohol wipe or get some water on a paper towel and wipe it across there, um, it will ensure that you can use these pads over and over again. But if they pick up a lot of body oil, you're not gonna be able to use them for very long. But as long as you um, keep your skin clean when you put these on, these will last a long time. So our protocols vary depending on what you're doing. Um, most often, you will put this on your left wrist like this. So you're gonna, those three acupuncture points I showed you earlier, you're basically gonna place this across the wrist. So it's over those three acupuncture points. See that? And typically you're gonna do this on your left wrist. Um, sometimes our protocols will say, put it on your right wrist, just follow as the protocol says. Um, there are other times when you'll actually take this and you will place it below your belly button, like roto it right over your abdomen. Um, and so you would just take it and place it down here. And then the other end of this, there is, um, there is an ear clip in your bag. And I'm not going to put mine on because I've got earbuds in right now. But you take the black cord, you connect it to the earbud, and then you're just going to clip it on your ear. Okay, so you're going to have an, a, an ear clip on your left ear, and you're going to have an electrode pad on your left wrist. And this is going to all be connected up so that, the, so that the black cable runs to your left ear to the ear clip, 
and the white cable runs to the, um, the cable on your left wrist. Now, once you have that connected up and you turn the unit on, so I'm gonna hold this here just so you can see how it works. If you then go and you're gonna keep this on the negative polarity, so on the back, you're gonna see it says negative. You're gonna to go to the front and you're not gonna push this button up here. You're gonna come down to this button right here and you're gonna push this button. And once you do that, you'll notice that the light starts to flash and it doesn't make any noise. So this is going to run for probably about 13 or 14 minutes. Um, after which it's going to beep to let you know that your first time interval is done. So you, it's designed that way so that therapists um, in clinic will know when the first portion of a treatment is done. Um, so that's your general setup on vagus nerve stimulation. Um, and there are some things that we need to talk about in terms of actually using the vagus nerve stimulator, um, the do's and don'ts of this. So. You always want to start slowly with this. So the first time you do this, you're only going to do about a five minute treatment. So you're going to clip on your ear, on your left ear. You're going to put a pad on your left wrist and you're going to set this on the negative setting and you're going to turn it on and leave it on for about five minutes. And that's it. That's going to be your first treatment. Um, some people notice a huge difference um, after that first treatment. Um, most people will notice that it just changes the way they feel a little bit, um, but you want to work your way into this slowly. So after the first treatment, and I typically do the first treatment uh, in clinic with my patients. Um, so if you're a clinician and you're giving this out to one of your patients, um, I would demonstrate how to use the unit and do a quick five minute treatment on the unit just so they can get an idea of how it works. Um, but if the patient has been highly, highly stressed and in a lot of pain, um, sometimes it, um, it brings them down pretty quickly and they get really relaxed really fast. And you don't wanna kind of overshock their system with that. So a very brief treatment is the way to go. Um, after that initial treatment, then I'll send the patients home and have them continue to do what, whatever I ask them. So typically they'll start off five minutes uh, at home the first night, bump up at 10 minutes. Um, and then after, after that, uh, they'll probably go up to about 15. And sometimes I have them doing it as long as 20 minutes. Um, in terms of treatment, um, for a really healthy person, um, I find that I use this about twice a week. And that seems to be good for me. It seems to help me recover from uh, stressful days at work and stressful exercise. It helps kind of settle me out. Um, but if I do any more than that, um, it makes me feel a little bit tired. Um, now, if I were really sick or really stressed, then I would use this more than once or twice a week. So if you are recovering from something like COVID or you've just run an Ironman triathlon or you're extremely ill with some kind of autoimmune disease of some kind, uh, you would find yourself using this uh, more than once a week or twice a week, probably every day for a little while. Um, but again, I would slowly kind of build up. So maybe the first week I would do um, five minutes of first treatment. And then I would bump it up to about 10 minutes for the, for the first week. And then the second week I would move to about 15 minutes. And by the third week, I might be doing this as much as 20 minutes. Um, and at that point, if you have questions about um, if you should be doing more or less, um, it would be a good idea to, to get in contact with if you're if you have a practitioner who recommended this to you to ask them what they want you to do. Um, and you can always get on our forum and ask questions as well. Um, you're not going to hurt yourself with this, but sometimes it'll make you a little bit tired. So I find that for myself, the best time to do this is typically um, in the evenings before I go to bed. Um, and if you work out and plan on using this for your workout recovery, um, uh, Amanda, no, it is not normal to get blisters on your earlobe. Um, so Amanda said she got blisters on her earlobe. So, um, I'm guessing what has happened here is your earlobes are really dry. Um, what you need to do, and the electricity is going through a tiny little point. 
So you need to moisten the actual um, moisten the actual pad of the um, of the of the ear clip um, so that the electricity is spread through a larger area. Um, sometimes even when you're doing e-stem in um, physical therapy offices, you'll find that even with pads, if the patients have um, if patients have really, really dry skin, they'll end up with one little area that gets irritated because that's the only area on the skin that's hydrated enough to conduct the electricity. Um, so when you start out with this, I would, I would, um, I would turn it on. And once you push this button, if you can feel it in your ear, like if it, if it feels like it's thumping in your ear a little bit, then you wanna start turning it down. And the first time I do a treatment, I would just leave it on the lowest setting um, and then slowly kind of bring it up from there. But if you turn it on, you actually feel it in your ear, then you definitely need to bring it down a little bit um, and make sure you moisten the, um, moisten the equipment with just a tiny little bit of water. Sometimes I will, um, sometimes I'll use a, um, a little bit of EEG paste or conductive gel um, or, um, for EMG pads. All right, so um, where are we now? So we've got all of our equipment set up here. Um, somebody asked me to do the test again. So I'm gonna kind of go back to that real quick here. So we're gonna run through the setting one more time and then we're gonna go through treating scars. So this only takes just a second. So to test the tip of the equipment, you're gonna take this cup, you're gonna place it on the tip and turn the unit on. You're gonna to touch this metal plate right here. And then you're gonna to touch this. And if, if the light goes off and the tone goes up, then the pitch goes up and you know you're on, the, then you know you've got your, your setup correct. And the same thing goes once you put your, um, Put your electrodes on. So when you put your oval electrode on this metal plate and put this pad on your wrist, if you then touch this to your skin, you can hear the tip, the you can hear the tone go up. And if I do like this, you can hear the tone go up. And when you put this on your ear, with the ear clip, you should also hear the tone go up and the light should go off. So if the light doesn't go off, um, that means you probably don't have a great connection and you need to moisten the, the, um, the pad on the ear clip a little bit. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna go over how to treat a scar. Um, and of everything that we do with these units, treating scars is one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's what it's part of what I do for uh, work, and I've been doing it for years, and it's been um, it's been a great thing in terms of being able to help my patients out, and uh, also to um, to be able to um, to get some outcomes for people when they haven't been able to get outcomes for themselves, and nobody else has been able to help them out. And so if you'll give me just a second, I'm going to grab a marker so I can properly show you how to do this. So it's like just a second here. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So, so we're gonna pretend that this line is a scar, okay? I'm gonna show you how to use these to treat a scar. Um, I'm gonna turn this down just a little bit so you can see what I'm doing here. So 
when you treat a scar, the scar is non-conductive tissue. So it doesn't conduct electricity well. And part of the trick for getting a scar to release is being able to conduct electricity through this tissue, okay? Now, to be clear, you're not gonna get rid of the scar tissue, but you can actually change the density of the scar tissue. Um, it's an electrochemical change that happens in there. But the difficult part about it is because it's non-conductive tissue, you have to get electro electrons to run through that tissue before it's going to, um, before it's gonna release. So what we found, um, what we found is that um, the best thing you wanna, you can do to start out is to play ping pong with electrons back and forth through this scar. So by that, I mean, you're gonna take a unit in either hand, okay? And you're gonna place a unit on either side of the scar like this. And so what we're doing is I'm gonna pick a series of points about a quarter of an inch apart, all the way down through this scar. And I'm gonna put this unit on either side of the scar. So really what I'm doing is I am bouncing electrons across this scar, back and forth, back and forth. So I'm throwing them across, picking them up and throwing them back the other way. So by forcing the electrons through this tissue, you're starting to repolarize it. And so what it looks like in practice is this. So you're gonna put your thumbs on the metal plates. You're gonna look at the settings on the unit. You're gonna put one on the negative setting right there. The other one you're gonna put on this biphasic channel. So this one is gonna be all the way over to what's my left this way. And this one's gonna be all the way over to the right this way. So you've got negative on one side and biphasic on the other. You're gonna cradle these in your hand like you were holding a pen and your middle finger is gonna go directly over these buttons so that when you're ready to treat, you hold these buttons down. Now, it's important to remember that because we're treating scars, that's non-conductive tissue. So you're not gonna find acupuncture points when you go poking around on these scars. You may find a few areas that conduct electricity relatively well, but by and large, don't expect the lights to go out on these. Don't expect the pitch to change a lot. So the lesson I gave you earlier in terms of being able to find acupuncture points doesn't really work when you're doing this. Um, and let me change to a, a good battery here because I put a bad battery in this for you guys so you can see the, the change. All right, we've got a good battery in this one now. It doesn't matter which hand you hold which unit in. So you're gonna turn both the units on. You're gonna verify that the lights are on. You're gonna take this unit and you're gonna go on either side of the scar and you're gonna place the units down and you're gonna count out about 10 beats. After about 10 beats, you're gonna to move to your next two points, which are about a quarter of an inch away. And then after that, so forth and so on, all the way down the scar. So once you go all the way down the scar, you're gonna change the units in your hands. And again, make sure your thumbs are on this plate. The other thing you have to make sure you do is have skin to skin contact with the patient. So when we were doing vagus nerve stimulation, you had a cord that went from here to the patient's skin, to your skin. But when you're doing this treatment, you actually have to touch the patient. So if you have a patient's scar and the patient has pants on or something around that, you've got to get that stuff out of the way so that your skin touches their skin. Now, it doesn't matter if you touch with one hand or if you touch with two hands or if you touch with your wrist, um, as long as you have skin to skin contact. The more skin contact you have with the patient, the better off you are, because um, that's going to ensure that you have a good connection there. So you want to drop your hands down so that your hands act as a fulcrum, turn the units on, and so we're at the bottom of the scar now, and we're going to do the same thing all the way out. We're going to count 10 beats, 
10 B and so forth and so on all the way up. So that's two passes. We're gonna change them one more time. We're gonna make a third pass all the way back down again. So after that, that's, your, that's the first part of your scar treatment. Now, if you have more time, then clearly you probably wanna spend more than about 15 beeps on each of these, but we designed these protocols so they can be done in, um, in, in small bites. So in physical therapy, set, physical therapy settings where patients have other exercises and stuff they have to do and they have to get body work and stretching. Uh, we're gonna get to each end of the scar in just a minute. So you're gonna do three passes back and forth. And then you're gonna take the units and you're gonna go at, you're gonna start at this end of the scar and this end of the scar. So you're, you're at either end of the scar. So you're gonna turn these on and do what's called tapping the scar, okay? So really what we're doing is we're running electricity. Now that we've kind of opened this up to be conductive, we're, we're gonna run electricity up and down through the scar, okay? And you'll see in, um, in some of the instructions, you just kind of cap the scar like this. And again, I'm making sure that if this is a patient's skin, I have my hands on the skin. So I'm doing this. Now, you'll notice in some of the uh, literature that it, it just caps the scar. Typically when I'm treating patients in the clinic, um, I actually kind of work the unit through the scar a little bit. Because by doing that, it forces more electrons to the tissue. So this is a game of not treating acupuncture points and not treating the vagus nerve. But this is a game of passing as many electrons as we can through here with this microcurrent. And because it's a small amount of electricity, you have to use a fairly sharp tip. Uh, no, you do not need to touch your own skin when you are treating your own scar because you are, but by virtue of um, touching this plate, you're making the connection. So as long as you have the tip of this unit on your skin and you're touching this plate, then you're good. So what we know from measuring this stuff with diagnostic ultrasound is the measure is called the saccadric gradient density. And you're going to get probably um, probably about a 20% reduction in the density of the scar. So the scar tissue is still gonna be there, but it'll be much more elastic um, once you have repolarized the tissue. And you can actually see the change happen on ultrasound. It's a very fast change. And whatever change you get in the scar, um, it's a permanent change. So it's not gonna go back to where it was before. So if, um, like, let's say I treated my scar like I had, you know, I had an old scar that was anywhere from a year to 50 years old. Um, if I treat that scar um, today, whatever I get out of it today is going to hold. And if I go back and treat it next week, then that is going to also um, continue to add to it. So every time you do this, you're going to go a little bit farther with it. And it doesn't really matter how old the scar is. I've treated some very old scars that were 50 and 60 years old. And they respond just as well as any other scar. Now, if you are treating a new surgical site of some kind, you have to remember the tissue is going to continue to change and knit over time. You can use these devices um, to, help, um, to help wound healing. So wound healing is an electrical thing. When you apply this around um, a surgical site, um, you don't want to go in the incision. You want to go around the outside of it. You want to make sure the tip is sterile. So clean this off with an alcohol wipe. Don't put fluid up in here because you can affect the conductivity of the, um, the electronics in here. So you just want to clean the tip off well with alcohol and work around the wound itself. So when you do that, it's going to do several things. It's going to increase ATP production. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. And that's the mitochondrial fuel. So it ramps up that by probably about four or 500%. It's a massive increase in ATP production. So it really kicks off the healing process. And you're also going to um, increase local circulation in the area, um, as well as um, increasing, increasing protein synthesis. So um, it's a really good tool. Um, if you're a therapist and you're working with patients who have joint replacements, um, 
or even things like open heart surgeries. Um, you can you can go and start immediately after the surgery. Now, if there's a dressing, you don't want to mess with the dressing unless you're the therapist or the doctor. But even if let's say let's say that this was um, this was an open heart surgery scar on a patient, and it had a dressing over it of some kind, like this. So this is the wound dressing, my little plastic guy here. If you go outside that, okay, you can still conduct enough electricity through this tissue to increase the healing process. Um, and I have not only used this on patients who have had um, who have had uh, joint placements and stuff like that. But I've had a couple of friends who've had non-healing diabetic ulcers. They've been through wound care and they're really having problems. And I've been able to use this um, to, um, I've been able to use this to, to heal up those non-healing uh, diabetic ulcers. So it's, it's a great tool for that. Um, one of the questions that, um, that somebody asked was, can you use this if you have metal implants? Absolutely. Um, there's there's nothing there's nothing in in the literature about not using this. Um, I've used this for literally decades on people with metal implants. It's perfectly safe. Um, every once in a while, you'll have a patient feel a little tingling around where the implant is, but they're not going to get any burns. Um, and plates and screws in your neck, uh, plates in your skull, uh, rods up and down your back joint replacements, all those things are fine to treat with this. Um, the only thing you don't want to do is stick this in an open wound. So the general rule of them is don't put this anywhere you wouldn't put a pencil. So, you know, not open skin is fine, but open lesions, you don't want to put this inside just because of infection risk with where we have been treating with this before. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see if we can get to some of the questions here. Um, let's see what we've got over here. Um, if we have two units, what's the combination? A negative and biphasic? Um, yes, if you have two units, you put one on negative, one on biphasic, and then when you get to the end of the scar, you switch and go the other way. You can move the button, you can move the slider switches if you want to, it doesn't matter. Um, can you still work on a scar with metal implants, uh, like a knee joint replacement? Absolutely. Um, pacemakers, um, I typically get the, um, treating physician to, um, to sign a release for me. So there's a safety letter you can get with this, um, and send it to the, to the physician. Um, I've, I use this on my own father when he had a pacemaker put in and, um, I have seen people use this on pacemaker scars, but again, I would urge you to get the physician involved, whoever did the surgery, and get their okay first. Um, tendon repairs require scarring to heal. Uh, so how this, so you're not going to, you're not going to um, impede the body from forming scar tissue when you do this with a tendon repair. You're just going to keep the scarring from, um, it's easing, that's all. So it'll still bind everything up and that's not a problem. I've used this on, like, on Achilles tendon repairs. Um, so that's not a problem. Um, what's the difference between the white tip and the blue tip? Uh, this, is, um, this is a slightly older version and you'll notice that with this one, so this will just go on indefinitely. This doesn't give you a, a beat at any point. To, to let you know that there's anything going on. Um, this one is timed so that when, when this goes for about 13 or 14 minutes, it's gonna give me, a, um, it's gonna give me a, 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 an audible cue of what's going on. So this basically just tells me how long I've been treating the patient. Um, and plus the, um, the insides are a little more advanced on this. So it looks the same on the outside. Uh, but the insides are a little bit different. Um, this is actually, even though these look the same, um, this is actually more expensive to produce than this. 
Um, in the natural health book, there are no signs for positive or negative for each point. If we don't know what to use, is there a default? Uh, actually, in the natural health books, there is, um, there should be a sign for the negative uh, and positive if you look on the side. Um, but if, if you have questions about it, uh, you are, you're not going to get it wrong. You can just get it more right. So um, if you're trying to bring something down, which is going to be most of the pain conditions, that's going to be like asthma attacks and pain, trigger points and tight things, um, you're going to use a negative polarity. So usually you're con dealing in conditions that are too much, but occasionally you have conditions where it's not enough. So say like your adrenals were fatigued or something like that, you might put it on a positive setting to, um, to bring that up. So you might treat uh, like a kidney source point to bring your kidney energy up because that helps bring your adrenals up. Um, if you were doing an acupuncture facelift, um, you might treat with a negative setting inside the, inside the creases, but you might use a positive setting on the muscle that you wanted to bring up a little bit. Um, when working on the scar line, does it make a difference which unit is at which end? Um, I mean, positive or positive. No, it does not matter when you're using these units. Um, at either end of the scar, it doesn't matter which one. Um, it just matters that you're passing the electricity back and forth. So, um, no, there are no contraindications for metal at all. So you do not need a waiver for, for metal implants and things like that. Um, and we've had these units tested um, and they tested out fine with pacemakers. But again, you know, you're not the doctor, you didn't put these pacemakers in. So you need to be in communication with the doctor who put them in just to inform them what's going on. That's all. Um, have you, uh, yes, we actually have used this. To, so the question is, have you used this to help with uh, closing of diastasis recti? Um, actually, yes, we have. If you go on our forum, there are actually a couple pictures, some are on there, somebody who uses on diastasis recti. Um, I haven't done a lot of that myself, um, but it does seem to, in reports from patients, it does seem to help. The next question, when working on the scar line, does it make a difference, which you know, we've already done that one. Okay. In the book, it says treat the lower leg after the scar tissue work. Okay, so in the world of um, scar release, um, after you have um, treated the scar itself, um, from an acupuncture perspective, um, scars are considered to block energy. So, um, so when you block energy, uh, it interferes with things. So let's say I had a scar, um, like a like a C-section scar or like a wide abdominal surgery scar. That's all your ascending energy. So that's that energy gets blocked below there, and it doesn't doesn't circulate the way it's supposed to. So the the chi gets stuck as a way to think of it. And so after you've released the scar, if you go to the lower limb, there are a couple of acupuncture points listed down there. But if you treat those points then you can help force energy up through that scar and helps actually clear the scar itself. Um, it's also a good tool to use on pushing, um, pushing lymph out of the, out of the lower limbs. Um, and we actually do a full uh, lymphatics course on this. Um, you can check that out if you're interested in our courses. Um, let's see what other, let's see what other things we have here. Yes, uh, someone said they saw a video where they put a pad on the lower back when treating a scar. Um, that is certainly a technique that you can do. So um, let me bring this back up here. So when you're doing the treatments, um, when you have something like abdominal scars, um, that tends to be very, very deep adhesions. And it goes, so the numbers are like this. If you have one abdominal surgery, you have about an 80 to 85% chance of getting abdominal adhesions. And so that scar tissue that goes beyond the boundaries of the incision itself. If you have two abdominal surgeries, it's a 100% chance. So that scar tissue can actually wrap around your organs, it can wrap around nerves. Um, 
uh, I had a friend of mine who um, had some abdominal surgery. And after the abdominal surgery, she later had her rupture. And what they found was the scar tissue had actually scarred her appendix to her psoas muscles. So they actually had the two appendix loose from the iliopsoas muscles. So it, there's a lot of very deep scarring there. So um, what the person is asking is, uh, so what you can do is you can take this and, and instead of using a hand, you can put this pad on the back and use this through the abdomen and it pulls the electrons through there. You still wanna use two units if you have them. So you would end up putting two pads on your back and it pulls those electrons down through the abdominal tissue and you can get a deeper release with that. All right, let's see what else we have in our questions here. All right, so um, back to using these. So if you, um, if you have a scar anywhere, so let's say you had a scar on your wrist and you had a scar that ran down your wrist like this, say like right there here, you could actually put a pad on the back of your wrist here and then work, work through the tissue on this side. So that's how you would do that. All right, what other questions do we have here? All right, anybody have any more questions? How would this work for endometriosis? It actually works pretty well for endometriosis. So there are, um, there are a number of things you would wanna do for endometriosis. You would actually wanna do a full back treatment. So if you look kind of like the poster behind me, um, there are a series of acupuncture points along the spine. And um, these are all the nerve roots that run to your, a lot of those run to your internal organs. So you'd wanna treat those. Um, and then you can use this to do an abdominal treatment. Uh, where do you find the treatment for diastasis recti? There is not a published protocol on that. Um, you would use a general um, abdominal protocol. So what I would say is, um, if you uh, looked at the way we just treated a scar and pretended like um, there was a scar with the diastasis recti right there, um, then, then you could just treat up and down through that, okay? So treat it just like you would a scar. And if there's anything pulling it apart, that will help open it up. Uh, that's with... Um, this, the example I gave with one unit, you could do the same thing with two units. The, the difference is that if you're treating yourself uh, on your hands, you only can use one unit. Um, but if you have yourself treating someone else, you can use two units. All right, other questions? Uh, no, you cannot use this over clothes. So the tip of the unit actually has to come into contact with the skin. This doesn't touch the skin. You're not doing a treatment. Um, you can use the tip of this through clothing. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, but it has to be clothing that is slightly porous. So if I was a therapist treating someone and I knew there was an acupuncture point right here, I could turn this on. And I would have to touch the patient somewhere skin to skin. So I couldn't touch right here because I don't have skin to skin contact. So I could say, touch their face. Um, I could set it down and then you have to work little circles. And the reason you have to work little circles is you're trying to get the tip of the unit through the clothing itself, okay? If you, if you don't get the tip of this unit through the clothing, um, it won't do anything at all. So you've got to be able to touch skin with this. Uh, other questions? Uh, no, this is not just for professional practitioners. This is actually showing you guys how to treat your own scars as well. When would you use this on the wrist as opposed to the abdomen? Oh, you're talking about with VNS treatment. So um, general VNS treatments, 
you're going to go left ear to left wrist. Um, but um, if you find that um, it doesn't seem to be as um, the Facebook group, okay. Um, if you find that it's not, doesn't, you don't seem to be getting the effects you need from the wrist, you can move it down to the abdomen. I would say if you're having, um, say, digestion issues, digestion issues that are affected by stress, um, you might put the unit that you might put the um, the electrode itself down on the um, down on the abdomen. Um, the you can actually, if you have one of these devices, so this is to answer a question. If you have one of these devices, you can join the um, you can join the Facebook group. So you don't have to be a professional as long as you own one of these devices, uh, because you might be somebody who's trying to treat a family member. Uh, you, guys, you can actually order these. So the question is, where can you get these charts? So um, you can get these charts um, from, um, from the Dolphin Neurostim Company, for, uh, so from Acumed. Um, so um, if Hetfi can probably post a link on, on online ordering for this. Um, but we have those, and we should have a few of those in stock. Uh, there are, there's, also, there's also a smaller version of that chart. Um, it's about the size of a piece of notebook paper, um, but we do, we have at least, I think we have a few of these in, um, in stock down at our distribution center. Uh, treating for TMJ, there are absolutely protocols for treating TMJ. The thing to remember about treating TMJ is that there are a lot of things that factor into treating TMJ. So um, there, if you look in some of our books, there are protocols for the points on the face but you have to do um, you have to do a lot of neck treatment as well. Uh, we used to do some work with the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, and uh, those guys specialize in TMJ type stuff. And when I talk to those guys, they say about sixty or seventy percent of most TMJ cases actually start trigger points in the back of the neck. So if you don't treat the back of the neck, you're going to miss a lot of the stuff in here. Um, also, the sternocleidomastoid muscles can refer pain up into the jaw, as can the scaling muscles. And the other thing you need to remember is that if your hips aren't level, um, it, changes, it changes the way you hold yourself. So there's um, excessive tension on one side versus the other, even though you hold your head level, your body's not. And so if the low back is off, that's actually something that affects TMJ. So when you do this treatment, um, for TMJ, you need to treat the low back, you need to treat the neck, you need to treat the TMJ stuff itself, you need to do a good psoas muscle release, like the deep hip flexor muscles, uh, because that'll pull you forward and get your head forward like this, as if you can open up the abdomen. If there's any abdominal scarring, C-sections, hysterectomy scars, open heart surgery scars, uh, breast augmentations, explants, any of that stuff, all those are scars that will pull you forward and will um, thyroid scars and they'll accentuate uh, TMJ problems as do plastic surgery scars in the face. Uh, there's also a trigger point you can get in the soleus muscle that will refer pain to the jaw and you can do shots to the jaw, you can massage the jaw, you can adjust the jaw, you can treat acupuncture points in the jaw and that pain will not go away until you treat that point in the calf. It's very rare, but it does happen. Um, there's an acupuncture point on the side of the leg called gallbladder 31. Um, it's about halfway down the iliotibial band. It's GB31. That's a good point for treating TMJ problems. I've seen it unlock jaws in some people from time to time. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we do with TMJ. There are dentists who use this equipment and um, therapists who specialize in TMJ work who do use this. Uh, other questions? Okay, the question is, in protocols, um, do we use both units or one unit? Um, and the answer to that is, um, whenever you can use two units, do use two units. Um, but if you only have one unit, then that's fine. Now, the exception to that is when you're treating in the ear, um, there are a lot of little acupuncture points in small places in the ear. So in that case, you want to um, use this and work very carefully. And you're never going to stick this deep into the ear, but you're basically just going to use you're going to use one hand to kind of stabilize the head, so that 
the person can't jerk and you end up sticking this down into their ear. Um, but anywhere else that you're, you're, you're doing a protocol, using two of these is always better than one because in the world of acupuncture, um, you're, um, you get good outcomes with treating single points. You get even better outcomes when you combine points together. So an example of that would be um, somebody who has um, a lot of chest pain, um, but they are also um, they're also grieving a lot. So you on the wrist would treat this point we learned earlier for chest pain, pericardium six, because that influences the chest. But because they're grieving, that's a lung issue, and you would treat a lung point at the same time. So you would do these two points in conjunction with each other. And that's called a circuit. So anytime you treat two acupuncture points together, it's a circuit. And there are dozens and dozens and actually hundreds of acupuncture circuits that we teach in our workshops. Um, all right, so other questions? Um, so the question is, uh, when treating through acupuncture points, do you recommend waiting a few days? Um, it depends on what you're treating. So if you're treating something that's very acute, for example, um, you have COVID and you're trying to um, keep yourself from, from getting deeper into COVID, um, you're going to treat those acupuncture points daily. Um, if you're treating a more chronic condition, um, something that's been there for a while, I typically like to wait uh, at least a day between treatments. So if I treat somebody on Monday, I might treat them again on Wednesday um, and maybe again on Friday, but you certainly need to give the body time to adjust to what you've done. So when you treat acupuncture points, you are giving a set of instructions to the body, turn this on, turn this off, bring this energy up, bring this energy down, push energy here, pull energy there. And you're actually changing things structurally as well. You're releasing muscle groups. And that does take a little bit of time for the patient to acclimate to. So um, you can, um, you can, I'm not gonna say over treat, but if you treat too much, it kind of confuses the issue. So every time you treat an acupuncture point, you're giving the body a set of instructions. Um, and the simpler you keep that message, uh, the better off you are. So if you have a protocol in your book that says, um, uh, that has say 15 acupuncture points in it and you get and you do seven of the points and the patient is 80% better, that's a good place to stop um, and just kind of let things settle out. Um, because if you keep pushing beyond that, you, you're adding more and more instructions to the set. Uh, yes, you. so the question is, can you, um, so the question is, uh, when you use this on yourself, can you use the same pad over and over? Yes, you can. Uh, the next question is, uh, when I you do the vagus nerve stimulation, um, the light flashes some. Um, if you don't have a great connection when you're doing vagus nerve stimulation, then sometimes the light will flash a little bit. Um, you might look at the adjustment. If you adjust it over to dry, it's going to make it a little more sensitive and less likely to flash. Uh, the absolute most important feature of this is the tone though. So the hot, when you have a really high pitch, you have a good connection. Um, if you have a low pitch, you don't have a good connection. So if you put this on the lights flashing a little bit, I would say, no, oh, that's probably okay. So how many treatments to a really dense scar on the dorsum? Um, if you get about a 20% reduction in the density of the scar per treatment, you're looking at five to, like I would typically tell a patient five to eight treatments. And I treat some pretty bad scars, um, which actually does bring up a point. So if you are treating a scar that's not aligned like this, but looks more like this. So you've got a, um, you've got kind of a, a circular looking scar here, you know, just, a, like a burn scar. So on a scar like this, you're gonna treat all the way around the scar and keep the units opposite to each other. And then once you're done with that, 
you're actually going to go through the scar tissue itself and just kind of pick random points through the scar tissue itself. Again, you would do three circles around. So one, two, and then three to get your three passes and then work for the tissue itself. Um, and that's, this does work well on burn, burn scars as well. So even um, old, thick scars, wherever they are, uh, this responds quite well. And usually the older the scar is, the better it works because the scar is really settled out and it's not gonna morph much more. Um, other questions? Um, it's a little easier to find points in yourself um, simply because you don't have to go through the trouble of having to get skin-to-skin -skin contact with the patient. Um, so the question is, is it easier to find acupuncture points on yourself than on other people? Um, a, a little bit, yes, because it's your thumb touching here. But if your thumb is really dry and you touch this plate, you're not going to have a good connection. So you want to make sure that um, you don't have any lotions or creams on your thumb. Um, and um, so that when you turn this on and test it, you know, that the light goes out. Um, it's a little bit easier to find things on yourself because you can kind of take your time. You're not under any pressure. And, um, and, you're, and there's, there, aren't, there isn't anything else in the circuit but you. So when you're using this on a patient, try and get as much skin contact as you can. Like, so try and get your entire hand somewhere on their skin when you're treating points. If you're barely touching them, you are decreasing the surface area that the electricity can come back through to get back into this unit. So the more you increase that surface area, the better off you are. So typically when I'm working on a patient's back, I'll have my, my arms actually kind of on the patient's back so that I have all of this in contact with the patient. Should you moisten the thumb if you live in a dry climate? Um, typically you don't need to, unless you find that, here's, this is how I would test it. Turn the unit on, touch the metal plate, touch your finger to the tip. If the light goes off, you're good. You have plenty of contact. Um, if that light doesn't turn off when you do this, when you have a couple of fingers on this pad or your thumb on the pad and you touch this, then if you need to do one of two things. You either need to moisten your thumb or you need to actually clean the surface with a little bit of alcohol because you may have gotten a little bit of oil on there. And oil, the lipids and oil or, or creams can actually interfere with the ability to find acupuncture points. Um, other questions? Best way to treat concussions. Oh gosh, we have a whole entire course on just on treating concussions. So um, vagus nerve stimulation is actually a really good way to start with treating concussions because it's gonna lower the inflammatory response in the body. It's going to increase your heart rate variability, um, which is uh, uh, basically is gonna, is gonna boost your ability to recover from it. It's gonna keep cortisol levels low, which is your stress hormone. Um, and it's gonna help kind of clear your head as well. So um, if you are interested in a full on concussion course, we do offer some concussion courses. Um, and somebody asked a question earlier about where do we learn more of these circuits? So this is just kind of a basic introduction to how do you hold the unit and how do you basically treat the scar? We have um, live workshops. Uh, I teach some of them, some of their other instructors teach them. Uh, we have scar workshops. They're typically two day workshops. So it'll be a, usually a Saturday, a Friday and Saturday or a Saturday, Sunday, depending on what it's typically Saturday, Sunday, but sometimes professionals will set up a Friday, Saturday. Uh, and you'll have anywhere from 10 to 25 or 30 people in class. Uh, we do our basic standard protocol stuff. Um, and we, we also do workshops on how to, how to treat concussions. Um, would this help atrial fibrillation? Uh, well, I can tell you that low frequency direct heart, direct current will not fibrillate the heart. So it's not gonna make it worse. Um, there are emergency acupuncture points um, for treating heart problems. Um, I haven't gone after um, cardiac problems, so I, I can't give you any, uh, any advice on trying to change atrial fibrillation. 
Uh, my sense is that if you did this over time, you might see some improvements. Um, I would do some vagus nerve stimulation work and I would use the parasympathetic calming points on the wrist. Um, but it's gonna take a doctor to test whether or not your atrial fibrillation is improving. Um, other questions? Let's see here. Um, actually, we did do a workshop for All Children's Hospital in um, Tampa. And um, we taught them how to use this device to release spasmodic torticollis in babies. And I have treated some very small, small, small babies um, using some acupuncture points to, to, treat, um, to treat things like that. And I used them on my own children when they were babies to help with um, colic and get them to sleep at night and things like that. You just wanna do a couple of beats at a time. So just like one, two, three, and kind of be done with it. So, um, you know, the younger they are, I would go gentle with it. Um, question, there's a question on music on pregnant women. So the general rule of thumb in um, a lot of the clinics that I've worked in is that if you're going to do ESDM of any kind, you don't do it over a gravid uterus. So by that, they typically mean don't stick this directly over the abdomen. Uh, but I have seen a, a lot of treatments done. Uh, I treated my wife when she was pregnant and uh, use this for things like bringing her blood pressure down and for cramping and um, treating her back and doing a lot of different things. And we actually use it to, to speed up labor uh, once she was in labor. So, uh, you know, you wanna make sure there aren't any, uh, you wanna make sure it's not a risky pregnancy um, where there's some kind of autonomic dysfunction going on with the patient who's pregnant as well. Um, one of the questions I just saw was, can you use these on diabetic neuropathy? Absolutely. Uh, the clinic I work in now has a diabetic neuropathy program, and this is one of the interventions that we use. The thing to remember is um, with a lot of uh, diabetic neuropathy patients, you need to treat the low back as well, uh, because that's the nerve roots that feed the feet. So you want to open that up first before you go down and start treating the feet. But this will increase circulation of the feet, and it will help kind of wake things up down there. Um, other questions? Um, you had a mesh put in for uh, umbilical hernia. How would you treat this? Treat just like a scar. So treat the, the, where the incision is itself and then treat all around there. Um, and just where you know the mesh is underneath. So the next question is, um, uh, could you use this on a perineal scar? Uh, yes, you can use this on a perineal scar. Um, so we use these on things like episiotomy scars and stuff like that. So that is not a problem. Um, so at this point, we're kind of getting towards the end of um, the end of our time. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, I think we've got about three minutes left here. So any other questions before we kind of sign off here? So as an example of the sciatic protocol, how would you know where to put the units? Um, I would use all the acupuncture points actually. So when you look on the sciatic, pro sciatic protocol, it's gonna have some points in your low back. You need to treat those. You need to treat the points on the hip as well. Um, and you also need to treat the points down on the feet because that will do a lot to stimulate the release of muscles in the back that compress the spine. Um, and also kind of reprogram those nerves. Um, okay, so can you use this on rheumatoid arthritis and would you use vagus nerve stimulation or acupuncture points? Do you actually use both? So vagus nerve stimulation, um, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune type condition. So typically you have a lot of, um, systemic inflammatory stuff. Um, and just like my patients who have MS and all other autoimmune conditions, if you do vagus nerve stimulation, it drops the overall level of, of systemic and inflammatory problems. You still need to address all the dietary stuff, get rid of the sugar, get rid of the processed wheat and those kind of things because those are inflammatory. Uh, so it'll help stop the progression of it. Um, and 
you can actually treat on the areas where you have swollen joints and stuff like that. You'll notice that if you take the unit and move it around on those areas, that you will find um, that you will find that um, you'll find little areas that are highly conductive in there. If you just hold it on there and move the joint a little bit, if you can, um, that you'll see some changes. So it's it's a nice intervention for that as well. Um, and also, uh, let's see what else we got here. I'm trying to keep up with you guys. There's a lot going on here. Um, somebody, if you just type the question, type it again so I can see it because I'm not bringing it up here. Oh, wait, here we are. Let's get back to the chats here real quick. Um, okay, uh, somebody said you didn't mention using uh, the vagal stem on the right ear on positive as in the book. Um, typically, we skip using the right ear. It's very stimulating unless you find that this is sedating you too much. Um, I wouldn't use the, um, the right ear stuff uh, very frequently. Um, where are there other free tutorials? Uh, we do some on here. If you join our, um, if you join our Facebook forum, uh, there's a lot of really good advice on there. Um, uh, oral procedure or wisdom tooth removal. Can we use the dolphin unit right away? Absolutely. Uh, you can use it on the outside. You can treat scars inside your mouth as well. Um, there are scars in there. I wouldn't put it in the socket itself, but you can use it immediately. And I would use it before you have the procedure done so you can lower the overall level of pain you're going to have afterwards. Um, let's see what we got here. Okay, what kind of battery? Okay, good question. So um, I'm gonna go over um, real quick how to change the battery in these units. So um, if you look at the back, okay, and this is very important. I'm glad you asked that question. So um, there are screws in here. Do not take the screws out of the unit. That will void your warranty. There is a battery compartment on the back of here. If you just pry that open, I'm using a knife, but you can use a screwdriver or a quarter and open this up. There's a nine volt battery in there. So here's your battery. You're gonna notice that it's a tight fit. And when you go to put the cover back on, it's gonna feel like you're gonna break it. It's not gonna break. It's just gonna snap close, okay? Stick to Duracell or Energizer batteries. Don't use other brands. The odd thing is that um, nine volt batteries do not all come in the same size. Some are a little bit longer, some are a little bit shorter. So this battery compartment is designed to accommodate most nine volt batteries, but some manufacturers, oddly enough, do make them a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, it just depends on where they're made. And sometimes even with the same brands, you will see longer or shorter batteries. So just stick to Duracells or Energizers and you should be fine. Um, don't buy the like the Duracell Pro or the Energizer Pro, those are actually a different length. Um, don't use rechargeable batteries, use regular alkaline batteries. Um, it's just the best way to go with this. Rechargeable batteries will stop in the middle of treatment and you'll have to go change the batteries. Whereas if you're doing a treatment and, um, and the unit, if you notice the light is not on, you can still get enough of a treatment done before you have to stop. All right. Um, Take one more quick look here. Um, yeah, nine volt alkaline batteries. Um, so the question was about sciatica. Yes, you can treat sciatica. Um, so the to answer the question on sciatica, um, when you are um, when you're working down the back, you're going to put a unit on either side of the back and work down those points on the back. And then, um, then connect up the points in the back to the points down the leg. When you get to the points in the feet themselves, treat those individually. All right, um, guys, we are past 8.30 here. So um, let me get back to my main screen here. 
Um, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. I know it's a lot of information. Um, please do join our, um, join our Facebook forum. Um, I get on there and answer questions. A lot of our instructors get on there and answer questions. And we can um, kind of help you guys along with this. Um, and keep your eyes open to our website and look for workshops in your area. Uh, you can certainly come out and come to the workshops. It's a nice place to network with people. There's a lot of professionals there and you get a lot of free treatments too. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, all right, guys, well, have a nice night and um, thank you so very much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.